Don Burt was the production designer on Mank. I'm Riley Chow of Gold Derby. You said that you watch films from the time period in your preparation for Mank. Yes. Uh, I'm wondering, are you jotting down notes while you're watching those films or what's the process there? Um, well, in this case, I was primarily watching the films that were made in Los Angeles during that period. Um, I, it, was, it was more research in terms of what the city was like. Um, I watched Sunset Boulevard um, several times, mostly because it, you know, it had quite a few scenes that took place around Paramount Studios. And I was just trying to harvest some details about the city, you know, just looking for, you know, scenes that took place on streets, scenes that took place in neighborhoods, you know, gathering information on what street signs were, along with the, um, just the photo research that we had done for the period. I just thought it was a good way to sort of get a sense of what the city was in, in that period. Now, this film doesn't take place on, say, a pirate ship or in a haunted mansion. So I'm wondering, what was the big undertaking for you as production designer? No. Oh. Well, probably the biggest undertaking was just sort of wrapping my head around that period of the 30s and specifically in Los Angeles. And the, and the film sort of broke down in terms of, of sets. Um, it broke down in terms of locations and sets with you know, shooting the studios in Los Angeles, shooting other streets and other locations in Los Angeles. And then we had these two sort of outlier locations, one being the, um, the ranch, North Verde Ranch, and the other being the Hearst Castle. Um, so sort of, that's sort of how it all broke down. So, you know, it wasn't a movie that, I mean, the movie was, we went to a lot of places and did a lot of filming. We were trying to get a sense of the city. We were trying to show that in a very simple way. We weren't trying to be complicated with it. And we realized that we had to approach it simply because so much has changed in Los Angeles over the period of time. And Los Angeles, more than any other city that I know that I've experienced, you know, it, it you'll have a historic building, but within two weeks, you know, you'll have a Starbucks next to it or a Trader Joe's across the street or what have you. So, you know, that was a challenge in itself. And, um, you know, just with locate locations in Los Angeles. I understand that you opted not to visit the Hearst Castle. So I'm wondering if you've heard from anyone who is familiar with the current property and what they thought about your recreation. No, I haven't heard from anybody there. <laughs> I opted not to see it because um, I was pulling actually some really beautiful research from the period. And I even found a couple of film clips when Hearst had a couple of his parties there with Charlie Chaplin arriving and so forth. And I always kind of on this film wanted to keep the context of it being in the 30s. I didn't want to step away from that. And I was finding some really, some really strong research from the, mostly from the Academy Library, to be honest with you, of the castle in that period that was in black and white, which really helped because to see it continually in black and white just sort of set a framework for what we would be doing. Um, so as I looked at the research, I sort of just, you know, trying to replicate Hearst Castle is virtually impossible because of, you know, the detail and the, the indulgence that goes into it. Um, so I knew that it was something there we had to get, we had to get a sense of it and sort of instead of replicating it, you know, try to emulate it. And without going there and getting overwhelmed by all the detail, I thought it was better to just stick to the research, be selective about what we were trying to do visually with it and approach it from that direction. You mentioned the North Verde Ranch set. Uh, now that one, a lot of it is just kind of, we're looking at Gary Oldman lying in bed, uh, which is quite different from you know, the extravagance of a castle. So I'm wondering how do you make that visually interesting and kind of add flair to it if you can? Right, well, when David and I first scouted it, we went through, first of all, we were beneficiaries of the fact that the location is fairly well intact from you know what it was in the 30s um aside from some air conditioning units and uh, some obvious electrical um elements that were placed around um we were sort of gifted this location when we scouted the interior of it um david was you know stating that he wanted it to be more than just a man in a bedroom. And so we sort of just took some different elements from different rooms and decided to sort of add a 
have a kitchen next to a hallway, give it some dimension so that it wasn't so flat and so boxed in, you know, something more than just a man in a bed in a room. So that's how we try to give it a little, you know, some layering to it so that it was something else, you know, and it, there's a certain romance to it on the desert there. And we, we wanted to try to preserve that in our set. Stuff like air conditioning, uh, what are those things that did not exist in the 30s and 40s that you found yourself just having to take out all over the place? Oh, wow. I mean, it, it's kind of amazing. You go into a room and you start with light switches, you move to doorknobs, you go to hinges, you go to security cameras, you know, on the back lot of the studio. For the most part, the studios were intact. They were what they were. Um, but then when you started to really look, you realized there were ballers, there were fire hydrants, there were security cameras, there were um, punch codes on next to doors, there were steel doors instead of wooden doors, you know, and then all of a sudden you realize you had like this three page list of things that, you know, you need to, you need to camouflage, um, which isn't so much a creative exercise, but it's one that's respectful of the period. Um, and then the same thing happened at North Ferdy Ranch. They had air conditioners in the unit, units in the windows. They had electrical um, lines running across the exterior. They had modernized their patio. We, we tore up their patio and we put in a flagstone patio. We, um, we revamped all their wood on the exterior, their posts and their beams, we restored it all. You know, so there's, there's always more to do than meets the eye, you know. And what about uh, on the other end? Uh, is there anything that you're having to add back constantly because it just doesn't exist anymore? Well, yeah, I think a lot of the things that you, you swap out, for instance, I mentioned light switches and door hardware. You know, that's obvious of we need period switches, we need period hardware, we need period light fixtures, um, you know, all those kind of elements, a lot of hardware, period hardware elements. We had uh, assistant art director who was virtually consumed with that the whole show, you know. It was um, it was kind of impressive how much he actually had to end up doing through the whole show for every door, every window. You know. I was going back through your filmography and I noticed that you didn't come up as like an assistant art director or set decorator. You kind of went straight to the top at a production designer and you've been there ever since. Uh, so can you talk about uh, how you came into the industry? Yeah, um, I came into the industry. I kind of came through the back door. I um, I went to art school in Arizona in the 70s and I graduated from art school and <clears throat> some friends of mine had a small scenery company there in Arizona where they were doing sets for commercials and regional commercials and so forth. And they asked me to help them and I kind of did it without really taking it seriously. And then one thing led to another and they opened up an office in Los Angeles and I came over and literally I started by working in their shop by sweeping floors. And then I started building sets, then I started painting sets, and I kind of came up through the ranks doing a little bit of everything. And I finally started art directing commercials fairly consistently in the late 80s. And a DP, um, Amir Mokri, recommended me to a director he had worked with, Wayne Wang, to do a small film, um, The Joy Luck Club. And that was my first venture into it. And quite honestly, I didn't really know what I was doing but <laughs> I managed to get through it and that's that's kind of that was my stepping stone so to speak yeah uh so you won an Oscar a BAFTA and an Art Directors Guild Award for your work with Dave Fincher on The Curious Case of Benjamin Button uh mm -hmm. now for Mank we're in award season now and on the Art Directors Guild Award website you know you can view design presentations of all the different projects that are in contention. Uh, mm -hmm. What stood out to me about yours, I, I guess, uh, first of all, is just that uh, there's no color in it. Uh, obviously, the movie is in black and white, uh, but I'm wondering why you didn't want to showcase kind of, you know, the process of translating what was actually there to um, what ended up on screen. I didn't really, you know, to be honest with you, I didn't even really think about that. Um, I think it was more that you know, the film to me exists, it, you know, it's something that wants to feel like it was made in that period. And it always in my mind wants to exist as something from that period. And quite honestly, as the film progressed, 
you know, and as we were working on it, we sort of intuitively started to see the world in black and white, you know, and because of that, it's just always been to me a black and white film as a film and as a presentation, you know. The whole testing of colors to, you know, what they would be like in black and white was a process that we had to go through. And it was interesting how certain colors like pinks and mustards and so forth, they really had a lot of depth to them in black and white. But at the same time for the sets, you know, I felt it was really important to try to stay with colors that the sets naturally would have been, the off-whites, the, the mid-tones, because, you know, to create a set and paint it an odd color and have an actor come in and try to do a serious scene about something just seemed a little bit, I don't know, it seemed like it was uh, kind of stretching it there a bit. So, you know, the challenge, I think, for me with the sets was finding those neutrals and which ones work best and, and you know, felt real so that when everybody walked onto the stage, walked into the set, it did feel real. So how do you create depth when you're dealing with all these grays or what turned out to be grays on screen? Oh, you, I mean, you know, we, we did glazing in a lot of, you know, a lot of sets where, you know, you paint a base color and then you glaze over it and that would help create depth to the paint. Um, you do it with lighting and in terms of hallways and doorways and so forth, you know, there, there are plenty of ways to create that depth, you know, and a lot of the sets were, had wood paneling to them. And that is inherently something that, you know, brings depth to the set. I understand that you wanted to go for a moody look on uh, this film. Can you talk about that? A moody look? Um, I, I think I saw that quoted. <laughs> I don't know if that was my quote, um, uh, might've been, uh, if it was. Um, I'm not so sure it was a moody look as much as it was a real look and something that felt, I think it always wanted to felt, feel like it was from the thirties. And, you know, it was, we used noir film as an inspiration, but I don't think we really sat down and said, you know, let's look at this movie and let's do that. Or let's look at this film and let's do that. And certainly we didn't do that with, um, you know, Citizen Kane, this was supposed to be the, the, the sister movie, The Citizen Kane. It wasn't supposed to be sort of something that replicated it in any way. Okay, so going back to the beginning then, I guess when you first talked with David Fincher, uh, what was the directive that he gave to you about you know what he wanted to achieve with this? Right, well, his directive was basically what I just said. I remember okay. speaking to him early, well, speaking to him early on, you know, he, we met in his office and I remember him being in the hallway outside his office door and him just saying, yeah, I want it to be like, you know, you're in a film vault and there's Citizen Kane on the shelf. And then you look next to it and you go, oh, there's Mank. I don't remember that film. And you pull it out and you watch it and it feels like, you know, a film that was made exactly at the same time. So, I mean, I think it wanted to feel like it had that historical value to it. You know? So, you know, as we, as I went forward with the film, you know, it was so important to try to keep it in the 30s, um, just with everything. And whenever, whenever we met challenges of, or so forth within the art department, I would always take a step back and say, okay, remember the research, remember the references, let's keep it in that time period. And uh, for a final question, uh, sure. Don, how would you describe yourself as a designer uh, when you're coming onto a project, you know, uh, what what do people think is your forte? Oh, what is my forte? I don't know. Um, I like to keep things simple. I always say I like to keep it simple, and then within that simple simplicity, build complexity. Um, I like to. I mean, I like to pay attention to the details, and I think I think it's important as a designer to to work the hours because your team especially on a project like this past one where the schedule and the budget were so challenging, your team needs answers. They need answers early in the day to go forward. And I think that, um, you know, one of my fortes is making sure that my team knows that, you know, I have them, I have their backs, you know, I'm there for questions. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to be negligent about what we're putting forth in any way, shape or form. 
Oh, all right. Well, I think that's what we'd like to hear. Uh, thanks very much for taking the time to chat. Uh, we have other interviews with the Mank team on our YouTube channel, and you can go to goldderby.com to make your own Oscar predictions.